hello everyone i hope everyone is doing absolutely well uh let me know if the audio and video is working and if you can see the screen so we can move ahead with today's session which will be on the radiological imaging of diaphragm so just please let me know in the chat once if audio and video is fine let me know in the chat so hi opsonized fago it's really uh, heartwarming to see that you are one of the earliest participants to join the class and always there diligently always present so hats off for your uh, good attendance and for attending all the live sessions because uh, whether you like it or not we have the recordings later on also but you know live session mein jo baat rehti hai wo baat mein recording mein nahi rehti because you can ask your doubts also plus there is more engagement so it's a real time thing like you know dynamic versus static okay everybody so uh, imaging of diaphragm actually it's an enormous topic which has a lot of vignettes but in this in this class i have included number one anatomy number two some important pearls from the physiology part of view which we need to understand in order to understand later on the pathology that is diaphragmatic function the different types how it can present in the form of a paralysis or a focal weakness something called an eventuration which a lot of time confuses a lot of us and then uh, i have also talked about some very important and commonly seen cases you know such as congenital diaphragmatic hernias okay so if you guys want more detailed uh, description and more focus on other types of pathologies also so i had earlier i was planning to divide it into two parts so this is going to be like part 1 where we discuss about a concept building class uh approach how to approach the dive from what is normal anatomy what is the normal thickness what is the functional assessment and so many important things which are basically your concepts and if you want we can keep a part 2 where we can address just hardcore pathologies about various tumors about diaphragmatic uh, the trauma aspect of diaphragm and in more and more detail about the hernia aspect okay so let's see let's move forward if you guys feel so you can just let me know and we can arrange another session as well which is going to be more pathology oriented and this is more like a brainstorming concept building class okay so no need to jot down anything just pay 100% attention whenever you want you can ask your queries in between and i'll be happy to address with that let's take the session forward so what are we going to cover in this class basically is going to be that uh, from the very basics that diaphragm is of course the very important muscle for ventilation for respiration but i'm going to tell you some other important functions of diaphragm also it is going to separate the thoracic and abdominal cavity which we all know the contraction increases the thoracic volume and drives air flow so very important pivotal role the primary function of diaphragm if anyone asks you is going to be in ventilation then we are going to talk in detail about diaphragmatic dysfunction which can present clinically in the form of mild dyspnea to total respiratory failure and the patient needing something like a ventilatory support so we need to have accurate diagnosis and management and lot of times we need to pick up even subtle uh, form of diaphragmatic dysfunction so that we can intervene early on and prevent patient going into respiratory failure multimodality imaging is there some role of fluoroscopy is there then some role of x rays going to be there ultrasound is important now this is one place where ultrasound has a lot of role and it is uh, like a hidden gem lot of people don't do ultrasound for diaphragm but today i'm going to tell you the b mode as well as m mode imaging and how to interpret the diaphragmatic dysfunction using ultrasound as a tool and then of course comes ct and mri which is going to be like the gold standard because mri is for both functional as well as anatomical assessment both of these things we can do with the help of an mr theek okay? hai so let's start so starting first things first anatomy and physiology so this anatomy part i have taken from an rsna article which has a very similar title anatomy and physiology of the diaphragm So, if you want to refer back, and if you want, I can also link the article in your uh, Telegram group after this class. Okay. So, we need to know that the development embryology is important. It starts around twelve to fourteen weeks of gestation. Now, there are four components which are going to form the diaphragm later on. Okay, embryology me there are four components which are going to form the final diaphragmatic muscle later on. Okay. So, what are these? One is your central tendon of the diaphragm. then one is your peripheral musculature which is going to attach to various bones anteriorly you have the sternum 
sideways, the ribs, posteriorly, the lumbar spine, basically the vertebral body, as well as the intervertebral disc of the upper lumbar spine, basically L1 and L2, and then via the arcuate ligaments. Okay. So here I want to tell you that there are four components primitively, embryologically. Number one is going to be the septum transversarium. So one is going to be the septum transversarium. This is going to form the central tendon pathway. We have beautiful diagrams coming up. So don't worry. Just listen right now. Following up, we have illustrations. Then you have the pleuroperitoneal folds on both sides, right and left. So you have the right and left pleuroperitoneal folds. They are going to form the peripheral muscle. The peripheral muscle on both sides. There is some part which is contributed by the esophageal mesentery. The mesentery of the esophagus. So, esophageal mesentery will also contribute. Take it. And lastly, what we have is the body wall, basically. The other muscles which form your body wall. The abdominal muscles, your external and internal intercostal muscles, your obliques, all of that. That is your body wall along with the bones, that is the ribs. Understood? So, these are the four components which are going to be contributed. Now, we know that there are three hiatus in the esophagus because vital structures have to pass from the thorax all the way up to the abdomen. So, number one, at the T8 higher level, you have the IVC, that is the cable hiatus. IVC at T8 level through which is also going to pass your phrenic nerve, which by the way is going to give innervation, sensory as well as motor. Then come the esophageal hiatus, which is at T10 level through which esophagus. And with esophagus, the nerve which will help us in digesting our tasty food is going to be the vagus nerve. Take it. And lastly, from the T12, we have all these vascular structures, aorta. Along with that, you're going to have your thoracic duct, basically the lymphatics and the veins as zygous as well as the hemi as zygous veins. So artery, vein and lymphatics, they're going to come last. May that is T12. So starting with IVC. Then comes esophagus and then comes the aortic hiatus. Now, this esophageal hiatus, it's not just a normal like an opening or like a rent in the diaphragm. It's actually reinforced with strong muscular slips. It forms a strong ring-like structure which acts like a sphincter for the esophagus and it prevents you from developing a gastroesophageal reflux. Okay, so this is important. It also plays the role of a sphincter. That is the esophageal hiatus at the T10 vertebral level. Now comes the physiology. So bilaterally, there is the phrenic nerve. This is important to understand that if there is a mass which is sitting somewhere in the mediastinum or in the pericardium, somewhere in the neck, along the cause of the phrenic nerve, it can result in diaphragmatic paralysis. And this is also important to note in cases of cancer of the lung TNM staging. There is importance for the phrenic nerve involvement and because that will uh, cause the patient to land up into diaphragmatic palsy and respiratory failure. Diaphragm is primary driver for quiet, uh, for quiet respiration, generating a negative intrathoracic pressure to facilitate the venous return. So during inspiration, another thing which is facilitated is going to be the venous return back into the heart. So inspiration and venous return, which are going to be linked together thanks to the normal function of diaphragm. Lung inflation and venous return. Dysfunction leads to compensatory accessory muscles use hypoventilation and atelectasis of the lung also. Okay, so here we are going to understand our embryology. So this part, this whole pink shaded thing is going to be the septum transversarium. And you can see beautifully how later on it is going to give part to the central tendon of the diaphragm. Okay. That is the septum transversarium or the transverse septum. Then you have on two sides, the right and the left, pleuroperitoneal folds or membranes. So this is on the right side and on the left side. They are going to form this whole peripheral musculature of the diaphragm, the periphery. Okay. Then comes esophageal mesentery around this. And as I told you, you can see this is a strong diaphragmatic slips are given off near the esophagus, which strengthens it working like a sphincter. And last but not the least is going to be the body wall complex, basically a body wall which is going to contribute. And everything should fuse together for an intact diaphragm, free of any defect, free of any hernia. Okay. 
So now that we know the embryology, 